From scenic strolls through beautiful mountain ranges and paragliding over desolate frozen wastes, to deep cavern treks, fighting monsters and spiders. Oh god, there is a lot of spiders in this game. Northern Journey is quite the experience. It's a game that combines atmospheric exploration with action adventure, having a strong emphasis on navigating the various vast environments through the lens of this eerie dark fantasy setting, travelling high, low, and slogging through all the carnage in between. It boasts a very interconnected world, with a great degree of environmental interactivity. It makes for an adventure game with a long-lasting impression. Being made by solo Norwegian developer Slid Studio, it's a very ambitious project, and yet, I have to say that after playing, it very much exceeded my expectations. It's a very passionately crafted and succinct experience, but achieves what it sought out to do. So let's further explore as to why I think it's a pretty neat game. So, you have a very typical opening of being some nameless adventurer shipwrecked onto this mysterious island. Arriving at the odd village of Deadwell, you encounter this travelling flute player, who enlists you with helping find some stolen items of theirs. That is, more or less, the entire plot. Of course it unravels and becomes deeper as you make your way throughout the island, but it's essentially a simple motivator for your journey ahead, but since you so conveniently shipwreck near them, you might as well help. Also, you may have already noticed that there's no actual dialogue options for yourself. Instead, you'll talk to someone by approaching them, and they'll say what they need to. It makes sense when you consider you're someone entirely out of their depth on this island, and are sort of just gawking at the people as you pass by. Because everyone's pretty damned weird on this island. Like, Innsmouth levels of weird. And these characters help feed into the sort of dark fantasy setting, being mysterious, creepy, and sometimes humorous. And the oddities only increase as you progress, and I think that makes for a very entertaining time. Northern Journey doesn't have some amazingly in-depth story, which is fine, because it's not really trying to. Just having a vague reason to explore is better than not having one at all. Because this is where the game really shines, just the sheer experience of exploring it. You'll come across a sizable cast of weird characters that you'll find yourself meeting with again and again, learning more about them as you progress, but the game really does tell its story through its environment and world building as much as it does through dialogue and exposition. So while there certainly is a finished narrative to the game with a satisfying conclusion, it's just not necessarily the focus of it, and I'd rather you see all of its twists and turns for yourself. This is a very beautiful game. In terms of textures, it obviously has that lower fidelity indie look, but overall, it really catches your eye. It has that early 2000s adventure game aesthetic without trying too hard to appear retro. The variety of colours in these natural environments, the use of fog, lighting and elevation, and the fact that it's a perfect blend of a fantasy setting, and yet there's probably a place that looks just like this in Norway, shows that everything is thoughtfully created, and getting to see more of it was the greatest motivator in the game. There's about a dozen unique areas for you to see, each with a varied biome, fauna, and means of traversing it. The way you get around in the game is probably its best feature. You go from just your typical platforming and ziplining across chasms, to diving into the depths of caves and swamps as well as the occasional kite flying and wall climbing. I think the most satisfying moment in the game was finally getting the rope pulley, and being able to use the zip lines which I'd been unable to use for the past few hours. Being able to suddenly retraverse previous levels and look down at what I'd previously overcome felt particularly amazing, and made me feel like I'd actually achieved something significant. So while the game is linear in terms of progression, there is a lot of back and forth, and not in a bad way. Because as you progress and explore more of the map, you unlock new shortcuts and feel like they have an actual tangible connection in the world because when you look at the map, they more or less do. Combine this with dangerous deep waters, elevators, zip lines, other contraptions and the various puzzles and hazards throughout the game and it's pretty evident to see why exploration is Northern Journey's strong point. It's exciting and challenging yet is always changing one way or another. And upon entering a new level, I was always looking forward to see how things would differ this time. Whether that was having to navigate around a lake siren, only to later be launched into its depths via trebuchet, or hang gliding across frozen wastes, and having to traverse what seems like a never-ending winding bridge. It's also vast, varied, and often had me pausing to admire the creativity of it all. The underground and underwater levels invoke this strong sense of claustrophobia, and make for a pretty scary and intense experience. 
getting lost in the near endless depths, having your field of view and movement restricted, only being able to see a few feet in front of you as your visor starts to crack and you're pursued by some underwater monstrosity. It is actually a pretty anxiety inducing experience and these segments are honestly a horror game on their own entirely. Contrast that to the level where it's nothing but zip lining and steady walking. A level with no danger serving as a peaceful respite letting you take a moment to slow down and admire the environment and look back on all the progress you've made. I felt genuine relief because I remembered hey this game actually looks pretty amazing and I'm not presently being chased by spiders. Northern Journey really plays the tense and scary moments off of the calm and pleasant ones very well making you appreciate both equally. You're on this island of witches, monsters, village idiots and so many other bizarreities. It's a creepy yet compelling world you want to see more of. This is magnified thanks to the game soundtrack. Each level offers at least one new song and it is a great set of ambient synth music which really gets you into the mood for exploration. And it'll alternate between light uplifting songs and more haunting downbeat tunes to fit the appropriate level and mood. It really can't be said enough how much the music makes the game. The Dead World theme repeats this catchy melody amidst ambient noise and serves as a familiar and comforting song as you find yourself coming back here again and again. In contrast to this you have the Haunted Glacier theme which is a chilling and intense tune which perfectly fits its area. Then there's the aforementioned level where there's nothing but zip lining and walking. Full Crush is this somber and comforting song which serves as a palate cleanser after going through such significant challenges. Those are some of the more standout tracks but the whole game is encompassed with great music which helps build a strong atmosphere. Northern Journey creates so many experiences and feelings just through the world that you explore. You can go hours without talking to anyone or reading a note. It's truly a testament to the game's level design when what is essentially a linear experience feels so vast and varied. So we've discussed the adventure half of the game, now we can get on to the action. As you progress throughout Northern Journey, you'll discover increasingly complex and powerful weaponry. Starting with just a sling, then a bow, to a powerful variety of crossbows and thrown weapons. All of these are ranged, they have differing fire rates, velocity and damage, meaning each has a fairly unique feel and a difference in application. The sling has infinite ammo and its damage increases with more revolutions, but it can't stay drawn forever. The rotating crossbow is high fire rate but low damage, effective for dealing with crowds of weaker enemies. In contrast, the bear crossbow is its opposite, a lot stronger but a single shot. And then you have thrown weapons, which are very powerful and aren't affected by projectile drop, but are fairly rare in comparison. That may seem like a lot more weapons than you'll need, but this game is pretty intense in its fights. With about 50 unique enemies and around a dozen boss fights, when you're not exploring Northern Journey's environments, you're exploring the menu screen, because you died to spiders again. For real though, it's challenging, but very fun. Most fights happen in small arena type areas where you'll find yourself constantly running, bunny hopping, strafing and trying to lead your shots perfectly as you fight hordes of monsters and insects. It really does feel like you're playing some sort of fantasy quake, which is pretty awesome. It offers a satisfying contrast to the relaxing cliff scaling and zip lining of the game's other half. Although you'll probably find yourself still dying to the environment more than most enemies, despite how challenging some can be as it does become a genuine challenge attempting to avoid and shoot enemies while also trying not to fall off a cliffside or into deep water. A lot of the enemies will seem very similar since there's a lot of spiders or flying bugs, but they tend to differ in their health, damage and movement pattern. Different flying enemies will have different strafe maneuvers, ground ones might charge, leap or hurl rocks at you. Some blend into the environment and scurry away when overexposed. Others simply need to be navigated around or lured away and are more akin to environmental hazards. So for what is essentially a bunch of bugs, they're capable of a lot of different things. One thing that will slightly stifle the flow of these fights is the prevalence of these dark barriers which require the souls of enemies for you to progress. Initially this wasn't an issue until I realised some of these barriers require the exact amount of enemies that are in an area, meaning that if you had previously passed some thinking it wasn't necessary to kill them, it actually was, and you'll need to re-traverse the level exterminating them one by one. But I don't think that was always the case on earlier levels, 
so it's a bit of a jarring thing to adjust to and can mean more backtracking. The various levels are littered with items for you to pick up. Ammo is ubiquitous and so are the yellow potions which heal instantly. Purple is harder to come by but can be taken to be used later. And to further reward expiration, there's a limited amount of red and orange potions that can be found throughout the levels. Red will increase your maximum health and orange increases your ammo and potion capacity. On top of that, you have a multitude of boss battles throughout the levels. They're all fairly intense and the majority of them are fun. The bosses vary in number, speed and tactics required, so all of them feel quite unique. Although I would say in the game's later half, there is some repetition in the bosses you face. They're still not bad, but not as exciting compared to earlier fights. Some of the bosses have unique one-off weapons required to fight them, which I initially thought was pretty cool. But it was a bit disappointing to be able to shoot a magic staff, only to lose it moments later. And I feel instead something similar could have been done like when you upgrade your sling, getting a damage increase and visual effect change to keep, rather than something that's flashy but only lasts for a few minutes. With all that being said, I feel just talking about Northern Journey doesn't actually give it the credit of how much fun I had playing. The experience is very much in its name, it is a journey to be sure, and a succinct one at around 10 hours. And yet it felt much longer just due to how much fun I had, and due to its impressive scale. There were moments where I dawdled about and found myself lost in the world, but pausing momentarily and trying again always led me to the right path. As the game does a pretty great job with using lighting and other in-game props to guide the player along. But I suppose it does make sense that I'm getting lost in underwater caverns, since you know, that's probably what would happen in a place like that. And there were some difficulty spikes for sure, but nothing that felt impossible either. Getting used to the environment, figuring out which was the best weapon for the job and some trial and error were all I needed. Although 80% of my deaths were still slipping off a cliff. Seriously, it's like the edges are covered in butter. And I suppose not running all the time is a way to avoid this, but that feels pretty necessary in fights, so it's definitely a damned if you do and damned if you don't type dilemma. So as a result, I suppose you just have to pay really good attention to the environment around you. Oh, and for the love of god, please use the multiple saves available. I forgot to and got myself stuck with no save to load back to and had to redo half the game. So, don't make the same mistake that I did. So otherwise, I am genuinely struggling for things to criticise the game on. Its faults are fairly minor, as listed above, and it's made by just one person, and I only paid $15 for it. And yet, it's got to be one of the most straightforward and enjoyable games I've played in a long time. If you're someone who enjoys exploring and interacting with large and varied environments, where you'll delve into caves, scale mountains step by step, and fend off some terrifying monstrosities with a host of medieval weaponry, I think you'll like Northern Journey. It delivered on everything it promised. It was a compelling action adventure game, which I found extremely fun. And I hope you do as well. Thanks for watching.